you can now hear Movie Heaven, Movie Hell on Stitcher. Stitcher is radio on demand. Listen anytime, anywhere. Stitcher is an award-winning free app that lets you listen to all your favourite shows, plus discover from 20,000 news, entertainment and sports shows. You can also create your own custom playlists. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad and in over 4 million car dashboards. It's on demand and it's on the go. No downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. You can stream your favourite podcasts from Stitcher. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at stitcher.com or in the App Store. And please leave us a review and rating on Stitcher. Thank you. Welcome to Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken, and... And I'm Keith Isles, and we are both independent filmmakers who enjoy talking about other film directors, both past and present, uh, what body of work. Indeed. So, um, just before we get on to our latest director, uh, just a, a quick update on the um, competition to um, suggest films for our New Year's podcast. Uh, the... It's now closed, and we're in the process of picking them. Oh, exciting. <laughs> and so uh, the winners will find out on the podcast, that, which comes out New Year's Eve. So, um, ah. yeah, we're uh, looking forward to uh, to making uh, us, you know, our picks from your suggestions, and uh, it's certainly going to be uh, an interesting podcast. Yeah, it's going to be the agony of choice, I feel. Um, you know, it's going to be hard to pick. But uh, yeah, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, nothing new there. We, yeah, we nothing ag- new. Agonize, we agonize over our picks all the time. Yeah, too much so, probably. But there you go. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Right. So, Keith, what is our pick this week of director? Okay, well, we're up to letter O now uh, on our first pass of the alphabet. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about an American filmmaker who. Um, has quite a, a varied and eclectic, um, you, you know, body of work out there, really. Uh, and I say he's a filmmaker. He is also, of course, an actor as well. And that would be Frank Oz. That's it. Looking, found someone you have. Mm? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> what is this, I think, you're going to hear on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> resist i couldn't no <laughs> <laughs> in case anyone's thinking what the fuck are they doing <laughs> frank oz... i don't think come on <laughs> there's nobody on this planet who doesn't know that frank oz is yoda nobody oh. i mean really there is nobody so the, the voice of yoda as well as many muppets yes that's it yes you know like uh fuzzy bear uh miss piggy yeah and uh, on on the on the Sesame Street as well, he's uh, what is he? Cookie Monster. <laughs> oh, cookie, <laughs> cookie, cookie, cookie. So, but but he's done a uh, you know a, a, quite a body of uh, directing as well. Quite a few mm. films um, in That's his time. Right. So, well, he he co-directed a couple of the Muppet films with um, Jim Henson. Yes, and for that reason, that we sort of didn't cover those ones because we will eventually get round to a Jim Henson podcast and All right. I think we'll we'll do it more justice there than doing it here. We're we're sort of concentrating on Frank Oz's solo work. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh um yeah, you, you know, again quite a quite a number of uh he's actually got 15 directing credits but some of those are of course television episodics and tv movies and things as well but um uh he actually started off with the dark crystal back in 1982 which i have to confess is a film that i haven't seen would you believe i believe it because um i've only watched it fully recently right um it's 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 one of those films where i've seen bits of 
mm-hmm. but I've never sat down and watched it completely until now. So um, yeah, and it, it it's a it's a film of its time. I mean, I you know I, I heard that they actually you know made it English when originally when they were on set the the characters had their own language and that was certainly would have been interesting but you know that was just the times they were living in because people don't want to watch films with subtitles yeah well on much smaller screens in terms of home video at the time i suppose as well but uh yeah interesting interesting okay so yes so frank oz (laughs) (laughs) well i mean let's uh let's get straight into it all right Okay, well... I I don't think we've got anything more else to say, really, do we? Mm, Said it all we have, yes. Mm. (laughs) Judge me by my size, you do. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, love it, love it. (laughs) Okay, so, uh, Keith, what is your uh, pick for Movie Heaven? Okay, well, I mean, I guess it'll come as no surprise to those who 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 know me and know my tastes and whatever that um i've actually chosen a um uh a heist crime um caper drama that he did uh in 2001 called the score okay which uh, i have to say you know obviously i revisited for this and I know the film did very well and whatever, but uh, I actually think it is somewhat of an underrated movie, actually, because I, I felt that this was, um, you know, in terms of the, the you know, caper heist subgenre of, of the crime film, uh, I actually think it's, it's very well done. It's very well put together. It works really nicely. It's got all the, the beats you'd expect, plus... Um, you, you know, I think in terms of actual direction, I think he's done a very good job with this. It's very different to a lot of the other films that he's made uh, throughout his career. And of course, um, you, you know, th- this this film starred Robert De Niro, Edward Norton, Angela Bassett and Marlon Brando actually in his uh, in his final film role. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I was going to talk a little bit about this, if I may. <laughs> of course you might right <laughs> um yeah the the score um i remember seeing the trailer for this when it came out and um it very much sort of um concentrated on edward norton's character especially because he plays um uh somebody with uh mental uh, he's mentally handicapped he's playing a character who's mentally handicapped so um the guards at this lockup, let him in and out and do whatever he wants, really, because they see him not much of a threat. Uh, so I remember seeing the trailer, and um, I have to say, the trailer gave away way too much. Oh, it was for one of start, those. Yeah, yeah. For a start, it, it showed you that he was only putting it on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you also saw part of the the ending. Uh, so when I watched this recently, because I hadn't seen it back in the day, mm-hmm. one that had passed me by. Um, it was enjoyable, but I knew certain things were coming up. I have oh, to say, that's a real shame. It, 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 but it's one of those films where even if I hadn't seen the trailer, it, it was kind of going through the routine. I, it was enjoyable, but you knew that at some point the Edward Norton character was going to, you know, um, turn on Robert De Niro. That he, you know, because they, they they do this in all these kind of films. Um, I mean, one of my favorite films is Heist uh-huh. with uh, Gene Hackman. And that film has so many twists in it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't know who's coming or going. Yeah. But that's the that's the uh, the thing about these kind of films. Yeah, it's a convention of that genre, most definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. that, you know, that you, you're going to get a team together and that they're going to do a heist. And one of them is going to try and screw the others over. And... Um, and because it was, you know, there was only a small number of players in it, you knew it was going to be Edward Norton. But, of course, the nice thing for me, and spoiler, is that Robert De Niro figured that out anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like he read the script and then went, oh, this guy's going to try and screw me over. So 
I've got a backup plan. And it works very beautifully. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, it gives Robert De Niro uh, the opportunity to say, you know, a lot of lines that he's sort of great at delivering, you know, like, when did you start believing you were better than me and all that sort of stuff, you know. But uh, but no, I mean, I like it. It, it is it actually is filmed and takes place in Montreal. So it's a yes. little bit of a change. Uh, it's not, um, you, you know, Canada trying to double for somewhere in the States. It's, it's actually um, it, it's actually, <laughs> yes, in Canada for once, which is which is good. And uh, yeah, I mean, it centers around um, Robert De Niro plays a character called Nick Wells. Um, and he's he's sort of one of those guys that's been, you know, he, he runs a, a jazz club, um, a local jazz club and, and sort of bar restaurant type thing. But, you know, on, on the side, he, he is um, a burglar, a, a, you know, um, he breaks safes and whatever for a living. And uh, he's been doing this for some 25 years years and has got to that point well in fact I, I do like the beginning I think the beginning they set up really well because mm. they have him um at a uh, breaking into a, a, a somebody safe to steal some jewels at a, at a very um plush mansion uh type home where there's a party going on outside and he's gone in sort of disguised as um one of the party organizers b- before cracking this safe and you you, you know he obviously does this and, and one of his rules is that, you know, nobody gets hurt and whatever. Um, and a couple come into the room and sort of start making out and he has to hide behind a, a sofa, you know, um, sort of mid the job. So he almost gets caught. And I think, I think again, in terms of Frank Oz's direction, um, I think this is done really well because, y- you know, there is some genuine tension there. Um, uh, you know, obviously, with an actor like De Niro, you've, you've, you know, you've got great acting chops going on there as well. Um, but, you know, th- this means that character is going to decide to to quit this. And he's obviously in a relationship with Angela Bassett, lucky man. And um, she's an air stewardess who comes in to see him. And she basically knows what he does. He doesn't hide it from her. But if, she, if he wants to have a future with her, she wants him to, to drop this, you know, playing this dangerous game where he could end up in prison um etc so uh you you know the deal is that he's gonna he's gonna stop doing this and become legit however he gets a very very uh big carrot dangled in front of him in terms of a possible four million payoff um to steal a uh um uh, yes a scepter treasure from the um uh montreal customs house and Mm. this is set up by uh, a friend of his for years, Marlon Brando plays. Uh, I think the character's called Max. If mem- uh, let me just check. Yeah, Max. And uh, <laughs> Max comes with this job. And Max is the guy that sort of does the deals in terms of he finds out about the jobs and he's responsible for getting the 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 money in and it's sold afterwards. Whereas De Niro is the man, the feet on the ground that actually goes ahead and plans it and steals it. However, in this particular case, because of where it is, um, Marlon Brando's al- already been working with a newcomer played by Edward Norton, character by the name of Jack Teller. Uh, and as you rightly said, um, he had been posing for some time as a as a uh, you know mentally disabled janitor um, that works in there and has got a rapport going with everyone. This has given him a certain amount of access and a you know kind of has meant that he's sort of able to smuggle things in easier uh, and using that sort of handicap as an excuse. And, uh, you know, this is this is Edward Norton um, playing that part. And, of course, you know, it's the usual thing. Uh, De Niro doesn't really want to work with anyone else and they have all the sort of usual, usual... Cli- they are clichés, but, it, oh, but, yeah. it's, but it's nicely done. It, it's very nicely done here. In fact, there's one line I really liked... Uh, that De Niro says when Edward Norton's trying to get to know him and asking him about, you, you know, um, what what he really wants. And, what, and, and, and De Niro turns around and says, you know, uh, hey, kid, if you, you want my information, uh, if you want my um, advice, what you need to do is think about everything that you want in life and spend the next 25 years, you know, trying to acquire those things and then get out, which... Uh, 
you know, obviously delivered much better than I did then. But uh, um, <laughs> oh dear, it, I, I thought your De Niro was uncanny. <laughs> but uh, I'm not even going to try. Um, <laughs> but uh, Yoda's one thing, De Niro something completely different. Um, well, I think with De Niro, you just got to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 yeah i mean you, you know what what i really like about the way this film's done in fact i like this about this type of movie anyway is you you, you have all of the sort of standard things with them planning uh planning the heist and again like most of these films there's a lot of attention to detail in this you know uh lots of um maps and plans and schematics and you, you know all of the tropes that go with that and lots of them staking out the place and working out security rotors and escape routes and plan b's and all, all of that sort of good stuff um and you know they're, they're going to do this this heist um unfortunately what happens just before they're going to do it uh the the customs house realize what they have and they have to up the security level somewhat. So suddenly you've got things like closed circuit television, infrared detectors, uh, more security guards, you know, all of this sort of thing going on just to make the job uh, harder and obviously up the stakes as far as this goes. Now, um, yeah, I was going to say spoiler alert, but you, you, you've already done it, um, <laughs> Simon. You know, it, it is basically they, they do carry this out and it all does seem to go, you know, wonderfully to plan. But at the last minute, the 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 Edward Norton character decides that he wants a bigger cut of the deal. And um, he decides to double cross uh, um, Robert De Niro's character uh, and put him in a potential a, a situation where he could potentially uh, get discovered because he, he makes him demask and stand in front of a camera that's about to go live to give him time to run off with the scepter. It's not much of a, a spoiler because when you're watching this film, even if you hadn't seen the trailer, you, it was kind of obvious that he was going to do it dirty on him because he was he was a, a character who wasn't exactly a team player. You know, yeah. I mean, from the first moment when he approaches De Niro on the street and he does the whole handicapped um, routine with him, and then doing stuff like, um, you know, he he sort of turns up at a meeting between uh, Rob De Niro and Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. You know, he he's just very somebody who's a bit uppity, and so you could quite easily, you know, see him sort of trying to do that he not he wouldn't be happy with just his cut he would want the whole thing so it was kind of like a character trait it was it was a bit too it was painted yeah so uh, if you hadn't really seen one of these films before you you get a sense that you know if he's able to fool like the security guards i'm sure he would be able to fool the people he's working with so yeah i i i, I know i hear what you're saying and i i understand what you're saying but uh, you know i'm not at the same time, I'm not sure that it it, it, it makes it blatantly obvious. I mean, it's it certainly, you, you know, that they, they have tension in their relationship, which is one of the things that makes it interesting. But whether or not it's absolutely obvious that he was going to uh, double cross him, eh, I don't know. I don't know whether I'd... Uh, whether I'd agree with that totally, but but I see where you're coming from. But yeah, but yeah. Any, but one of the things they do do very nice in this, um, because he did it in a very subtle way of foreshadowing, is um, what, while they're planning this and looking at the um, schematics, etc., there is a pipe um, led on the work side, which which is like they they they've done it to make sure the holder that they're going to put this in is the right size but it's really not flagged at all it is literally just there and you could almost miss it and it's quite nice that when he when it turns out you know he's done a switcheroonie and he's actually got that pipe instead of the actual scepter um i thought that was quite nicely done i thought that was, yeah it wasn't yeah. too sort of pointed and obvious um so no, i thought i no. thought that worked rather well um and 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 oh, and there's one great scene in it again, which is massively cliched now, but it did kind of make me really laugh out loud. 
can't remember the name of the actor or the character, but there's um, there's one scene where um, they have to get some uh, uh, codes for 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 the new safe. Um, yes. For, for this. Yeah. And 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 somebody basically these characters end up sort of holding this to ransom and they have to do this this meet in a park in a public place to get the codes but the uh computer guy that that ed norton uses um oh sorry not ed norton the computer guy that sorry de niro uses is is i mean he's your typical he's in a basement on his computer thing but what makes me laugh is he's got you never see his mum you've got his mum and he's always Uh, like shouting at her and stuff and what make does make me laugh is you've got this really tense scene with these two guys in a park you discover one of them's got a gun you know they're trying to do this exchange in the park and then right in the middle of it that the, the mum knocks on the door or something and he goes shut up bitch i'm on the phone and it's just the way <laughs> that, uh, that did actually crack me up i thought that was quite nicely done in terms of a tension reliever yeah but that whole the whole hacker thing in the mum's basement is such a cliche it is. especially from that time I mean, it's, it's such a sort of 90s, noughties thing where people just believe that, you know, people who use computers had no life. Yeah. Well, they still use it now to an extent. I I know. It's it's so, it's so pasté. It's so just, you know, it's one of those cliches that should just die because it just makes no sense. It's just, it's really stupid. Well, what they've done now is they've changed it slightly and they've made the computer hackers like, super hot babes and stuff like that like in arrow <laughs> and whatever you know so they they, they 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 they're still you know they they, they can still hack into anything and, and are nerdy and whatever but but they're like sort of smoking hot with it it's yeah yeah oh it's not just the women is it it's uh i mean chris hemsworth in black hat oh yes. you know he looks like a typical computer hacker, doesn't he? Oh, just like a computer hacker, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. <laughs> How did but, he do the hacking in between, you know? In between going, going to the gym. gym. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, God knows, God knows. But um, it was keystrokes in between push-ups. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, this film, um, I think, I, I, found, I, I still found it very enjoyable watching it again. Uh, interestingly, uh, even though, you, you know, it's now what? Uh, 15 14 15 years old or whatever um it didn't it still held up quite well it didn't look too dated because no, obviously no. I mean, a lot of the technology is still sort of used yeah yeah no i mean you're quite right i mean the only thing that sort of aged it was the whole hacker at home with his mum in his mum's basement thing with the mum who's always going you know trying to get his attention yeah no, no, I mean, I enjoyed it, and um, it was nice to see uh, Gary Farmer in there as uh, Bert, who was uh, Robert De Niro's friend, who goes round to rough up um, oh, that's right. Norton. Yes, yeah. And it... yeah, I thought, oh, okay, he's only got like a little bit part, but then he turned into a bigger part of the story because he was like their assistant. He was the one who drove him around town and stuff. Yeah, he was kind of the muscle of the team. Yeah, yeah but I mean, the whole bit when De Niro's scoping out the um, the underground tunnels leading to the customs house, uh, he's the one driving Edward Norton around. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I did like that moment where... De Niro needs to come out of the um, the sewer and Edward Norton um, sees a police officer and he, you know, he sort of goes over and asks him some questions just as De Niro's sort of hopping out of the, uh, out of the sewer plate. So yeah. that was quite, that was quite good. Uh, he plays those beats. He plays those tension beats really well. You know, this turned out to be actually a pretty decent movie. Uh, I know it's one that's not particularly well remembered or anything and that's one of the reasons i chose it and 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 wanted to highlight it but uh you know i think it's a pretty decent movie as far as this goes and what one of the things that i found out through doing some research on it which makes it you know surprising i mean we sometimes hear about how troubled productions actually can turn out quite good um Mm -hmm. apparently there was a lot of tension um, between Marlon Brando and uh, Frank Oz, apparently, oh, right. um, uh, you know, again, this is this is all stuff I've I've found online. Whether or not it's true, who knows? But apparently, um, uh, y- y- you know, Brando 
didn't take Oz too seriously and kept calling him Miss Piggy and Muppet and all this sort of thing and and refused to take some of the um, some direction uh, from him because you know he felt that his acting style wasn't being um, appreciated and things of that nature. So eventually, um, Oz had De Niro direct the scenes with Brando in because Brando would listen to uh to De Niro and not I mean it's it's quite funny you when you think about it you've got three generations of really good actor in this film um yes and you you know and and you know Marlon Brando uh wonderful actor but from from the sounds of it particularly later in his career you know he could be quite mercurial and and difficult and you, you know things of that nature and uh, even on the commentary um obviously he's been quite careful what he says as, as, the, as they have to be on these things but Frank Oz did say that there was uh, there was some tension there and um uh you, you know he he's his a lot of his stuff was was actually Fra Frank Oz would would stand outside the the room watching on a monitor and let De Niro actually deal with him obviously De Niro himself a, a you know a, a successful director in his own right but uh you, you know would let him do it which which i think is a shame um but you know the film didn't suffer because of it before you move on i just want to say that um yeah i mean even i mean brando back in the 80s and 70s he was was really hard i mean we all know the story about on the set of superman that he actually had his lines written up all over the place because <laughs> he couldn't be bothered to learn the lines i mean apocalypse now he turned up hadn't read the script hadn't read the book you know and put the production in quite a quandary i mean the fact that francis Ford coppola was actually able to pull something out of that was you know a miracle yeah oh no absolutely have you seen the documentary about the making of um the island of dr moreau oh no i thought you were going to say about the apocalypse no, the no. hearts of darkness no no one, no, no, no 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 there's a great one. Oh, okay uh it's on netflix uh i can't um i can't remember the full title but it's about how it the how that production went, and uh, Marlon Brando was a nightmare on it. He wasn't the only one. I mean, Val Kilmer had a lot to blame for as well. But it's a very interesting documentary. It is on Netflix, so it's you know it's well worth checking out. But um, just to sort of uh, finish my point, I also know what it feels like to uh, not. To, to have somebody else direct but um have an actor not listen to you and but they would listen to another another actor in the room uh i won't name names but um when i suggested that his idea of going to canal to film a uh audition um when i told him no we'll do it here he, he was like no no we we should go to a canal you know production values but when his friend another actor who told him the same thing he oh oh yeah yeah, you're so right i'm like so yeah i can understand i can feel frank oz's pain yeah i mean it yeah you know it, it, it's it's not that doesn't sound like an ideal scenario at all but um but no. uh and apparently one other thing that uh is interesting i wonder how noticeable it was if you didn't know it was there sort of thing um the final uh, the final appearance of brando in the film uh, he's listening to the news report about, um, you know, the the, the um, thing being stolen and yeah. um, that, that somebody, you, you know, the, the main guy got away. But obviously they, they're they looking for the uh, uh, Norton character. And apparently he refused to smile um, for the take. He absolutely refused to. So apparently in, in post-production, they actually curved his lips uh, on computer and it is weird <laughs> it is weird because when you watch it now you can, it's because he doesn't smile in the eyes at all so it does look a bit weird but I just wondered if I hadn't have noticed, <laughs> known that whether I would have noticed it or not of course no, I've ruined it for anyone have. listening to this now obviously no you wouldn't I, I you know it looked like a normal smile to me yeah yeah it's funny how computers can do small things but big things it, they're very noticeable yeah well, I mean, you, you know, apparently he just wouldn't do that. That was the direction he was given, and he wouldn't do it. So they they did that, and uh, and and you know, it clearly works. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, you, you know, in terms of in terms of how the film turned out, uh, I thought it was very good. Um, it did it did quite well. It was fairly successful at the box office, and uh, I have to say, I enjoyed revisiting it so um so that was my movie heaven for frank oz well uh my pick for movie heaven is a, a little film called bowfinger yay so back in 99 i was working in the cinema and uh, i got to see this film for free now normally i wouldn't go anywhere near an eddie murphy film because this is the time when he was doing the child-friendly films like um the clumps and what was that other one um oh, i love the clumps <laughs> <laughs> no no what's the other one there was the other one where he's dressed up as a fat woman oh is it big mama's house or something no 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 no, no it's not big mama's house it's oh god because he he was nominated for an oscar wasn't he at the time oh norbit oh norbit yes yes yeah but he was he was very much well known for these like you know make you know put himself in prosthetics and stuff and play multiple characters so when I, you know, I, I didn't really know much about this, but um, when I started watching it, I just sort of, I fell in love with the film because it's about a group of filmmakers who have, you know, no money, but uh, big dreams. And they just, you know, want to go out there and make a film. <laughs> now, um, Steve Martin plays the title, you know, titular character Bowfinger, who is in Hollywood trying to, you know, make a film. And he's very much a hustler and he is a he's got a script that's uh written by his sort of uh, part-time receptionist <laughs> 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 and um you know he tries to take it to uh an executive played by uh, robert downey jr and um he, you know it's one of those things where he overhears a conversation so he starts talking about it into his fake phone and uh, the name Kit Ramsey comes up and Kit Ramsey is like a huge star. Um, I can't try to think, you know, like a Will Smith at the time. So if you could, so the idea is that if he can get Kit Ramsey in his film, then he'll get a go picture. So he tries the obvious route of trying to sort of trick him into doing it. You know, here's the scripts, you know, uh, I think you'll love it. And then, uh, <laughs> of course, he doesn't want to know. But, of course, he comes up with this um, wonderful idea of, well, we'll put him in the film anyway. We'll just film him when he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, and beautifully done. <laughs> yeah. it's well, it's, it's, that's where the comedy comes from, is uh, these actors coming up to him on the street and doing all this stuff. Now, what they don't realise is that... Um, in real life, he's paranoid and he's paranoid of aliens and stuff. And they decide to do a film which is called Chubby Rain, <laughs> <laughs> which has at the end has the greatest sort of intro. This big raindrop with Eddie Murphy's face in it, all chubby. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> it's so crap yeah. and cheap, but it's so funny. Um, so he's part of this cult called Mindset, which is. Um, Oh, it's run by Terence Stamp. Yeah, it's it's kind of a riff on Scientology, isn't it, in some respects? <laughs> and so he's, you know, he keeps saying that of these sort of paranoid delusions that he has and that these people keep coming up to him and keep calling him, what's the character's name? Oh, uh, Keith. <laughs> it's Keith, <amazing>. yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm Keith, I'm Keith. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I mean... It's a film that takes a swipe at everybody in the film. Oh, industry. definitely. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I must admit, it, having, you know, having spent, albeit brief, but having spent a bit of time, you know, in the film industry in Hollywood, um, you know, I could, I love these type of films that do make fun of Hollywood and make fun of actors and producers and, you know, directors and things of that nature. I think they're always very amusing. And, uh, often quite quite close to the truth <laughs> that's it well i i actually i i quite like heather graham in this film i think she's oh she's really lovely good. actually heather graham is a really underappreciated actress and i don't know why she didn't get more parts because in this film she plays like you know 
all innocent and naive and by the end she's you know slept her way to the top because <laughs> it's I, I i remember at the time um hearing that it was a take on um oh that actress who was in the psycho remake oh and h yes i've heard that as well yes yeah 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 yeah, that it was a take on Anne Hesh because she did that whole, f- especially at the end of this film where you see Heather Graham's character with an Ellen DeGeneres character type. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, a Hollywood relationship. And yeah, Hollywood, le- well known Hollywood yeah. lesbian or whatever they, they call it in the film. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, I, I have to say, um, I'm so pleased you picked this because. Um, it is one of those films that had passed me by. I think the problem was it, in 99, that was when I still lived in the States. I'd graduated film school. I was actually making, you, you know, I always find that when you end up making films, you end up watching less films, which is kind of annoying, but just the way it is. And I think also yeah. by that point, my money was probably starting to run out as well. So I was quite picky and choosy about what I go to the cinema to see. And, um, yeah, as you said at the beginning, you know, Steve Martin and, and Eddie Murphy, even though they've both done some fantastic work, but maybe around that time, you know, they wouldn't have been top of the list or whatever. So um, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I mean, I watched it alone, but I laughed out loud uh, so many times during this. Um, yeah. And I just think it is it really, really is a great great comedy film and and you know we 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 should mention a little bit i mean obviously it's written by steve martin as well and of course it is indeed if, yes. if, if i originally what i mean one of the things i chose the score but i was at one point thinking of choosing you know dirty rotten scoundrels because that's another great film yeah. which steve martin's in that uh is yet another collaboration with um with Frank Oz. So, you know, they, they've worked together a fair bit, haven't they? Um, through his career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, they, they've done quite a few and I'm sure he's going to, uh, pop up in our movie hells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, but, um, yeah, but I mean, the, the thing is, I, I've, I think of this, I, I enjoyed this more than I enjoyed Dirty Rotten Scandals. I think with Dirty Rotten Scoundrel, I think, um, yeah, it, it was close. And, of course, that's the film everybody knows. Yes. But uh, I don't think Both Finger gets a, a, enough attention. I mean, there's just some, some great stuff. I mean, uh, the fact that, um, you know, Eddie Murphy does play two roles in this. He plays um, Jif, um, Kit Ramsey's brother. And they they pick him at first because he resembles Kit, even though he's got um, glasses <laughs> and braces. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I have to say, I was slight. If, if I'm honest, I mean, I love this film, and I, it made me absolutely crack up. And you know, it was one of those gems that I missed. So I'm glad I've seen it now. But when when it when it was revealed that he was he was his his twin brother or whatever. I, I was slightly disappointed by that. I don't know why. I think it would have been funnier if he'd just been, you know, a random guy who wasn't connected at all, you know? Um, but... Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I think it, it, it does work into the story. I mean, I don't think Kevin uh, Graham's character would have slept with him if he'd just been a nobody. Yeah. He wouldn't have been yeah. another, you know, link in the chain. Uh, the, the bit, I, I love it when he does the, oh, this is awesome, <laughs> when she, like, has to go topless. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And he, he just looks at the camera and goes, wow, this is awesome. That's <laughs> like, I just cracked up at that. Cause I thought, yeah, mm, I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh come on i mean the the classic moment is when he has to run across the uh the freeway which apparently for budget reasons they they actually and steve martin dug his heels in. i mean obviously this was produced by by brian grazer you know a big hollywood producer who's yeah. done a lot of work with them but apparently at one time um they did actually want to cut that scene uh so i've read um, you know, because of the, the the cost involved in doing that. But, you, you know, um, Steve Martin said, no way, it's going to be the funniest scene in the film. And, and I have to say it was one of the funniest scenes in the film, definitely. It was one of the funniest scenes. I think the funniest scene for me is when they're chasing uh, Kit Ramsey at the end in the car 
and you've got the camera truck with the bush on top of it. <laughs> and you, so you just see this moving bush chasing them down the highway. Now, that made me crack up. Yeah. yeah. Well, as independent filmmakers, you know, we, we, we definitely get yes. a kick out of yeah. that stuff as well. And, uh, you know, we, I, I definitely felt the pain of, um, of Bowfinger's character, you know, um, you know, wanting to get this stuff done and, you know, all the all the rich connected people not giving him a break and, you know, all of that sort of thing. It was it was very well done. The other thing that really cracked me up, I thought was really funny, and of course Eddie Eddie Murphy must have been loving it, was the intro to his his kit character, where um, you know, he's having a go at the uh the, the 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 manager guy and 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 when, when he yeah. brings up Shakespeare and he's going you see Shakespeare Sha-, you know he's trying to make everything racist and I just thought that was absolutely oh god hilarious. yeah the the bit where he's going he's he's gone into the script and he's counted all the K's in there and it's come up to like a to be divided by three <laughs> and know and he goes well what does that give you. KKK, <laughs> <laughs> the script's racist. I was like, wow, he's off his head. Yeah, that's hilarious. Um, but no, I just wanted to talk about the um, the Mexicans because there's a that, that wonderful moment. He goes, we're going to get the best crew we can possibly get. And then you just see him at the border <laughs> with, you know, trying to grab them and put them in the back of a truck. Yeah. No, it, 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 it's, it's, it, does, it doesn't, this film really doesn't miss an opportunity. I mean, it has got, you, you know, mm. ev- every every beat from, you know, from like Terence Stamp playing playing his part, you know, deadly serious, even though, you know, it's absolutely bonkers what he's talking about. And, uh, um, you, you know, right. it, it really is. It really does work on every level, I think. And, um, yeah, I, w- I was I was thoroughly entertained by this. And, uh, you know, um, interesting. There's not much in the way of deleted scenes. No, but I was going to say there is a wonderful, wonderful in joke in at the end because um, at the end it kind of you know the the film does get made, and um, even though they got found out, and uh, the the thing is that Steve Martin's character Bowfinger is he he's always dreamt of the day where um, a UPS guy comes up with a um, a, a package for him. And it, of course, at the end, this happens for him, and <laughs> they can, they've got um, an offer to direct a film in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> and so you there's this wonderful scene where you see Kit Ramsey doing like a, a ninja, you know, kung fu movie, and he's doing like the worst moves, and they're doing a tracking shot, and there's a mirror, and they stop in front of the mirror and you can see the whole camera crew and you can see Steve Martin go, move on, move on. <laughs> it was just, uh, it was brilliant. Yeah. It was just, it was a, it was a wonderful touch to that scene because the amount of times you see camera crews, especially in dolly shots. Oh yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, they did, they, they poke fun at the whole filmmaking process, the whole Hollywood star system, you, you, you know, all of that. And, and they did it really well um and uh yeah this is this is this is these two guys as well both at the top of their game i mean um you know eddie murphy spot on playing these dual roles steve martin you know he, he's great at this sort of stuff and obviously cuz he wrote it you can tell you know the passion was in it and they they just got themselves surrounded by a really really great supporting cast as well you know um so yeah, uh, you, you know, I, I haven't really got anything my bad to say about this. My one minor nitpick was the thing about the brother, but you, you know, other than that, and yeah. I mean, that really is nitpicking. Um, you, you know, this this works really well and is a really good production. So uh, um, thoroughly enjoyed that. So thank you for choosing that one because uh, I haven't yeah, seen that's, it. That's all right. <laughs> But yeah, I also, I mean, uh, it's got a good um, soundtrack to it. It's got uh, a lot of sort of old classic um, tunes in there. So uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's it's well. If you're not seen it, well worth checking out. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would uh, I would agree wholeheartedly. All right, well, let's move on to our movie hills. But we're as we speedily move on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. Okay, so for movie hell, um, I chose uh, 
the adaptation that they did in 2004 of the Stepford Wives. Um, this is obviously another adaptation of the uh, novel by Ira Levin of um, uh, obviously Rosemary's Baby fame. Um, and uh, what I did in this case, which I didn't get a chance to do when we were talking about insomnia with, with Christopher Nolan, is I did actually go back and revisit the, the original Stepford Wives film um, from 1975, uh, just so I could do a, an actual comparing and contrast in this particular case. Um, obviously, they're, they're two very, they're, they're made at very different times. I mean, there's nearly 30 years difference between them. Um, so obviously, the world's a very different place for one thing. But the other thing is, uh, they are very different takes on the material. Um, obviously, the original Stepford Wives being um, a sort of, you know, dark horror well, straight thriller. thriller. Yeah, um, take on it. Yeah, and this one is um, it's one of those things from the two thousands where uh, they took old properties and you know kind of took the piss out of them. Yes. Yeah. If you think, I think of uh, Bewitched in the same sort of, um, you know, kind of film as this. So they take a source material that's well known and they kind of, you know, you know, make fun out of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. They, they make it very fluffy. Yeah. I mean, it is a different, you know, um, I will give them that. They tried something different with this. In terms of the actual plot and the plot beats, um, it, you know, it, it, it hasn't strayed far in terms of what actually happens uh, is more or less the same, although they kind of tagged more of an ending onto this film. Um, but again, uh, yeah. this this is a film which, and I think it does, in, in contrast to the score, where I said there was, um, you know, a few production problems, but, you know, the film turned out, uh, you, you know, you know, good in the end this was uh, another film that was absolutely plagued with production problems but the film as a result totally suffers in so, in so much as it doesn't actually end up making any sense whatsoever and the, the reason being is as we all know in the original Stepford Wives which I didn't realize um, it started a franchise I didn't realize that through the sort of 80s and 90s they were mainly tv or director video films but there are actually about four sequels to the stepford wives you know loose sequels loosely based on on the material oh right um none of which i've seen i didn't know but that yeah, yeah, um, there was... i mean yeah i mean the, the stepford wives is is something it's well known i think if you've never seen it you you know what it means yeah you know it's in the zeitgeist yeah. Oh, no, definitely. Definitely. I mean, you, you know, yes, uh, even people who haven't seen it kind of kind of know, um, you, you know, it, it came from that sort of 70s wo woman's lib movement, you know, with with these wives being or acting and behaving like they were still in the 50s or whatever. And uh, it's, it's funny, actually, because some people say it's sort of uh, anti-feminist and anti-women. Whereas I think those people are kind of missing the point because when when you look at it, it's actually kind of taken the piss really out of the the, the men and the fact that the guys are uh, you know are living in the past, wanting these uh, these subservient type wives. Oh, right. are, <laughs> are we talking the remake or are we talking the original? Well, I mean, because what you just said it sums up the remake really well, but the the original. Um, we know it was that kind of thing where, you know, it was a dark thriller and the idea of, you know, women being free thinking and stuff and that the men, you know, felt they were out of control and decided that, you know, to put them back in their place is, was creepy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the time definitely, definitely the time, the, the sign of the times has, has um, you, you know, kind of kind of uh, changed the, the slant on the film as well. But the, the 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 problem the problem this film has is uh, it went through allegedly it went through a lot of reshoots. Um, 
so yeah, there there are reports of, of various problems on the set. Apparently, uh, Nicole Kidman and Frank Oz uh, had words on this, and there was tension, and they didn't get on particularly well. Um, there was apparently also a lot of studio interference um, into this, and you, you know, it's a shame because you've got a great cast here. You've got Nicole Kidman, um, basically uh, reprising the role that. Uh, Catherine Ross had made famous in the original film. Um, you've got Matthew Broderick, B Bette Midler, Christopher Walken, you know, Glenn Close. So you've got, uh, you, you know, quite a quite a decent cast here. And this is clearly a film that had quite a budget as well. Um, but it yeah. sounds like that there were lots of compromises to be made. It ended up in heavy reshoots and heavy re-editing and as a result, really doesn't hang together particularly well as, as, as a film. And one of the things that's, you know, sort of ridiculously confusing about it is on one hand, it implies that the, the women are replaced by robots. Yeah. But on the other hand, it gives yeah. a little sort of explanation that says they're not actually replaced by robots. They have chips implanted in their brains to make them behave differently. So it, it, yeah, it doesn't this, really work. I didn't quite understand that. No, it doesn't really no, work at all. I, I, I was, I was, I was quite confused by that because I thought because you have the whole scene where uh, one of the wives has a malfunction, you see sparks and everything coming out, and then, but yet at the end when the the, the chips are destroyed, you know they're they're back to the normal self. So exactly. So which was a yeah, completely reshot yeah. ending. Um, but yeah, ended up making it, you, you know, confusing and not really make a make a great deal of sense. So um, yeah, so I, you know, it, it's I don't know. It, it, for me, I thought it was quite poor, um, and you, you know, on rewatching it and as I said, comparing and contrasting it with with the uh, original film. Um, you, you know, this is inferior, and I can see why it was a uh, a box office flop. Um, and it's a shame because you know Frank Oz is clearly a decent filmmaker and can make you know films quite well. But it just seems that with this particular one, um, there'd been a lot of money put into it from the studio. Uh, there were a lot of people involved. Um, you know, obviously you had star actors in this as well that probably had input and opinions as well and i think um you, you know if it sounds like uh frank oz lost control of this of this film to a certain extent and as a result um you, you know it, it turned out to be a bit of a mess because of reshoots and re-edits and apparently it went through about four or five test audience things which is why things were changed and endings were changed and stuff was reshot and it was one of those exa typical examples of Hollywood and Hollywood money and you've got all the ingredients you've got good key players you've got a great team you've got a good budget um, and an interesting source material but what ends up coming out the other end, um, you, you know, hasn't hasn't really gone right, and um, uh, you, you know is compromised. And 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 there is a quote again, you know, who knows if this is true or not. But you know, Frank Oz says that he uh, he didn't follow his instincts. Uh, he had too much money, was too responsible and concerned for Paramount and the producers, and I didn't follow my instincts. Well. Um, there are a lot of on the, on the DVD. There are a lot of these EPK type behind the scenes, incredibly sycophantic <laughs> uh, interviews where everybody goes on about how great everyone is. But interestingly, there was there was a commentary as well that I listened to some of. I couldn't really sit through the whole thing, but um, you know, Frank Oz all the way through is saying, "Oh, you know, he's explaining everything and to why this doesn't work." And so he, he I think he 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 knows it's a mess you know <laughs> and uh yeah it wasn't it wasn't difficult for me to pick a movie how in this case because i i think of the body i i haven't actually seen all of frank oz's work but i've seen quite a lot of it and of the films i've seen mm. uh this 
well, and maybe one other that I'm sure we'll get to. But this is is uh, <laughs> definitely definitely a poor effort. I felt, and uh, it just really, it really didn't make sense. The other thing it did, which I didn't like, is where the um, the original ended, sort of in the supermarket with that that sort of dark ending, a real down note actually to end on. Um, this film tries yeah. to put some sort of conclusion to it, um, and as I said, I think the conclusion was one of the things that had gone through various reshoots and which is why it didn't make sense because this conclusion was what was adding that it was the circuitry and that the women could all sort of come back and be themselves where they'd actually established that there were, you know, robots. And you even had the scene where Nicole Kidman sees the replacement for her with the black eyes, which is obviously a, a nod to the original film. Um, and, uh, mm. you, you know, as a result, it's all very confused. Um, the other thing they did to try and update it is they added some gay characters. So you've got a uh, a gay, yeah. a male gay couple um, who, you know, you've got one as a very sort of flamboyant, uh, again, horribly stereotypical. Um, you, you know, they have him with a, uh, they go through his things and he's got like, um, uh, a picture of Orlando Bloom and then a T-shirt with Vigo Mortensen on and, you know, the hairspray um, <laughs> pro theatre program thing and all this sort of thing. But they change him to become this, like, senator-type, Republican-type character who, you know, goes on about he's no longer a sissy and, and all this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. And again, Bette Midler, she plays the character that in the first film there's a character called Bobby who who is who gets very transformed. Um, and Bette Midler plays that character in this. So she goes from this sort of arty, liberal um, person that lives in that absolute mess to suddenly being, you know, the the, the perfect wife with the clean place and they sort of they th there was one bit that slightly amused me where our kids come out and um they're all like uh you, you know they're all wanting these ridiculous things from their mum and sh and they sort of have a go at her because she hasn't bought them stuff <laughs> and whatever so it's got that whole sort of yeah. rant on materialism as as well in there which uh which as i said i, I can kind of see what they were trying to do but overall um i i didn't think this really no, worked it didn't work. yeah Right. Now, th this film ends like uh, so many other films do, and I don't know where this came from, but why is it that when something happens in a film and, you know, we kind of have a good happy ending, that the main characters end up on Larry King? Yes, yeah. Has Larry King got nothing better to do than yeah. talk to three people who just, you know... Uh, I mean, I've seen so many films where they have that ending where... They have Larry King at the end. Sometimes it works. I mean, the end of, um, oh, God, the Tony Scott film with Will Smith. And oh, Gene Enemy Hunter. of the State. Enemy of the State. Yeah. Brilliant ending where he's having a go at the uh, statesman and saying, you have no right to, you know, you know, snoop on me. Brilliant ending. And then you've got this one where it's like, you know, he clearly looks like he can't be bothered and he's been rolled out. It's, it's a paycheck. paycheck. No, totally. Well, I, I mean, you again, know. you know, this is a scene that makes no sense anyway, because you've got back three characters which yeah. were supposedly killed off and replaced by robots. And then suddenly you've got them back as them themselves. Yeah. So, yeah, very, very, very poor, basically. And uh, um, yeah, well, it was this one was a, a, is regarded both a commercial and a critical flop. And um <laughs> R rightly so. I mean, I think this was one of those things where, you know, too much money, too many stars and, you know, too much input from from too many people. And I, I think that Frank Oz kind of let the reins yeah. go a little bit, you know. Um, he, he did as well. And, you know, um, yeah, it's just not very good performances from anybody. But I, I was just thinking... I can't remember what the last good film I saw John Lovitz in. I think <laughs> when I see John Lovitz in a film, it's usually a mark of how not good it is. Well, you know, I mean, he's, he's funny. The last one I saw. Yeah, I mean, he's he's he, funny. But... In his usual, he does the same shtick all the time. Yeah. 
you know yeah he's always like the horny guy who just can't you know can't get anywhere with him because of his looks and his voice and yeah but yeah i can't remember the last good film i saw him in no can you no not really i mean not 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 that springs to mind but but you know um this just you know you know this just on all levels didn't work and uh yeah you know the the thing i do you know they did try and do something different with this than the the original um but you know for me uh the original worked a lot better than this did um this just didn't work at all it was just a mess yeah as, as i say it's just that whole thing they were going through at that time where they just they were making fun of the the shows that they were remaking yeah well we're still living in that where they take um films or books or stuff where people know of it and then they remake it and they try and sort of you know try and do some sort of spin so you know where they try and look at it you know with a cynical eye or it's sort of taking the mickey out of it. yeah i mean this is very much taking the mickey out of the whole sort of american you know, sort of Norman Rockwell meets Martha Stewart, you know, um, you know, pristine picket fence, uh, you, you know, facade, if you like, uh, 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 of a place. And um, that's kind of, you know, what the whole Stepford thing represents, uh, I guess. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those stories that to me, it works better as a thriller than it does a, a comedy. But at the same time, um, yeah. you know, we are talking about, you, you know, the seventies was obviously when, when that whole, mo- you, you know, liberation movement was was rife, and and the kind of whereas obviously thirty years things have changed, equality's changed quite a bit, and whatever. So again, to try and make it now as a as a thriller might not necessarily work anyway, but but this certainly didn't work as a comedy either. <laughs> But as I said, I think that was more down to the production than the material, perhaps, you know. I mean, I could, I, could, I was going to say I could pick it to bits more, but I just don't really, I don't really see the point. All I would say is I wouldn't recommend it if anybody's thinking of seeing it. I would like, uh, no, spend 90 minutes, you know, watching something decent. You know, I'd, I'd say go back and watch the original. All right. So um, moving on to my pick for movie hell. Um, this is a, a an, an earlier Steve Martin collaboration. Uh, he didn't write it, but he was one of the stars. And that is House Sitter. Mm. <laughs> uh, House Sitter came in came out in ninety two. Now, I remember my parents uh, renting this one because um, I wouldn't say my mum was a bit of a Goldie Horn fan, but she did like uh, Overboard. Oh, which is great. The one with and her Kurt. and Kurt Russell. Yeah, absolutely. In. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very enjoyable and um, and quite in, I quite enjoy huh. it. I mean, it's not something I would watch often, but I, I do enjoy it. So um, I think at that time, Mum quite liked watching sort of Goldie Horn comedies. And uh, you know, I grew up uh, watching Private Benjamin. Yeah, oh. um, I know she wasn't in the TV show, but I do remember the film. I remember just liking the bit where she's in the army camp, the b- beginning and the end bit. <laughs> I was never a big fan of, but the the whole bit when she's in training really enjoyed. Yeah. Um yeah, so so House City Sitter is Steve Martin plays this architect who decides as a proposal present for his um would be fiance um to build a house in his hometown. And he's put all his money into it. And he wraps it up in a big bow and he drives her out there to show her this wonderful creation she's, he's made. And, of course, she doesn't want to marry him. <laughs> so already uh, <laughs> starting off well. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, so he's, you know, not feeling good about himself. He's back in the city doing his job. Um he has his friend played by Pete, uh, Peter McNichol, who you mem- might remember from Ghostbusters 2 or Dragon That's Slayer. That's right, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to believe he was in Dragon Slayer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. 
um, you know, who's a friend who uh, is trying to sort of one up them and stuff. And he meets Goldie Horn in this uh, party and she's pretending to be Norwegian or Swedish or something like that. And of course she's not. And Steve Martin hits on her and he tells her all about his woes and about this house he's built and stuff. And Goldie Horn's character uh, is called Gwen. She's a, a bit of a chancer. She's, uh, you know, she has no plan in life. She doesn't have any fixed abode. She doesn't have like a, a full time job. She just moves from place to place. And and so she decides to go to his hometown and uh, move into this house. Now, when I when I saw this originally, I remember that Steve Martin didn't. I thought Steve Martin didn't come along until near the end, but it's actually he turns up halfway through and finds that she's living at the house and she's living a lie, having told everybody in the town that she his is his wife, that they had you know they had met under circumstances that were very romantic that um, she was wrapped up uh, her head completely and uh, he was there at her bedside all the time and they were having a wonderful time yet he didn't know what she looked like and uh, there was a lot more other lies and um, she just um, keeps lying and he tries to sort of get into this lie you know uh, he's not a very good liar <laughs> but um, she's able to convince the family and um, his boss to come to this housewarming party at the end. And of course, you know, he's trying to get back with his ex who's kind of looking at him in a different light. Now that he's married that whole sort of unattainable man thing. And um, they're playing it that they're going to have a big argument, get divorced so he can go off with his ex and she can, he's going to pay her money and all this stuff, but she really loves him. And he, he then suddenly realizes just at the end, he loves her too. <laughs> the end. Yeah. That is it. Mm, yeah. It's, it's, it's embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's one of these kind of comedy of errors kind of films, you know, it's just, Oh, you know, being caught up in the wrong lie and all this kind of stuff and having to be forced to do stuff. You know, she tells, his boss that he sang uh danny boy to his father and made him cry so it's part he actually has to yeah sing. oh not danny boy it's um Tulula, Tulula. and it's awful and of course he does it and makes his dad yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's playing it because he he's not he's not a singer no. i mean i mean i can't it's one of these things where i can't fault the acting no. in it i mean steve martin and goldie horn do give it their all but the script is just awful well, here's the thing. This is, I mean, I remember I actually saw this back when it came out is when the local cinema where I live, they used to have free tickets and free screenings to things. And this was one of those freebie films that I went to see at the time. And it was kind of, you know, I quite liked Goldie Hawn. Yeah. I thought she was quite cute and whatever. And Steve Martin, you know, he, he'd done a lot of good stuff up to this point. And I went and saw it, and I remember being pretty underwhelmed by it. And uh, watching it again, because I hadn't seen it since then, literally. So I thought, well, I better watch it again for this podcast. And uh, yeah, I was equally, if not more, underwhelmed. Um, but this is another this is another film that was done with Imagine Entertainment and Brian Grazer, who we already sort of yeah. stated is a you know a decent movie producer. Uh, however, this apparently the story of this was actually um, one he'd come up with. So I think it's one of those things where he might be a great producer, but he's not necessarily uh, a good film writer. As I mean, he didn't write the screenplay, but he came no, up with the no. story. And yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty um, it's pretty unbelievable um, on like loads of levels um, and. You know, it's just one lie after another, but it's pretty stupid. Um, but then again, you know, like you said, um, in terms of the cast, uh, like, I mean, you, you know, I couldn't believe this. And, and this was quite impressive to see this time. It's like, obviously, his parents are played by um, Donald Moffat and uh, Tony Award winner Julie Harris, who 
I have to say, I, a few years after she'd made this, um, sadly, she's no longer with us, but I actually did get to work with her on a film called The First of May. Um, you know, and I got to talk to her quite a bit. And, you know, obviously she'd done some amazing things like um, Robert Wise's The Haunting. And of course, it worked with uh, James Dean on East of Eden and stuff like that. So, you, you know, for this for this to then fall in her career, um, you, you know, it's quite sad, isn't it? But, uh, she, you know, the performances were fine. I'm sure when you met her, you were talking, you know, asking her loads of questions. About <laughs> Funny enough, I didn't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> you saying about your cinema giving away free tickets. I remember I got um, about the same time I got free tickets for the paper to go and see Don't Tell Mum the Babysitter's Dead, which was equally as awful. All oh, right. Yes, I'm trying to remember that one. I can't even remember that. Don't Tell Mum the Babysitter's Dead. Who was in that? <laughs> But, uh, uh, it's, uh, Christina Applegate. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it is awful. It's awful. It's not even. Um, I'm. I haven't seen it in a long time. But I, I remember as a kid when I saw Adventures in Babysitting, I wasn't too impressed. Oh, does this mean anything with the word "sitter" and it wasn't good around that time? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, actually, if anything, people. People quite like Adventures and Babies. Oh, I do. That's Elizabeth Shue, it isn't it? Pie, That's but... Elizabeth Shue. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, like that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, I'm, I'm, uh, well, not putting words in my mouth, but I'm not saying that if the if they had the word babysitter <laughs> in the title, it's bad. I just, I just remember that the whole free tickets, it is so bad that they had to give the tickets yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> and it seems to be the case. I can see what, I mean, this, this, this really is, yeah. I mean, when you said you'd picked it, I was like, oh, okay i don't really remember it you know let's go and i actually um i actually ended up because I, I couldn't find it anywhere i bought a copy of it on uh on dvd which will be going straight back down the um cex or charity shop or whatever or in fact we can give it away to our winner <laughs> along with free fall <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> those lucky people get free oh, fall and dear. there's more booby yeah. prizes than they are well, prizes well, yeah, aren't they yeah again, again uh, it's a winner it's well it's whatever we want to talk about isn't it <laughs> <laughs> but no uh but no this, this was this was you know steve martin you know he's very funny man very good and you know there's nothing wrong with goldie horn she's she's good with her comic timing and stuff but this just oh i don't know i found it i, I watched it and it was I know sometimes things are supposed to be cringeworthy for comedy, and I get that, you know, like Basil Fawlty or whatever, but this was sort of cringeworthy for a whole different reason. It was cringeworthy because it was kind of so bad. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Mm. I, it was, well, you, 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 you obviously do. Oh, you yeah, picked yeah. it as hell, but yeah, um, yeah I, it was just kind of, it was just, uh, yeah, it was just like, what was the point? I remember as a kid, and this is probably why I thought, when I watched this as a kid, I I I do remember I just couldn't sit through it. I I found it too embarrassing, and that's probably why I thought Steve Martin didn't find out about it into the end. But um, yeah, I just I, I've never been a fan of like embarrassing humor. You know, when somebody's in a situation that you feel embarrassed for them, and I, I've never been comfortable with that. And this oh. film is so much of that, and it's it just really yeah, it's got my heckles on edge. But it can work because, like, obviously, Rick, Ricky Gervais has made a career out of it. You know, being you're embarrassed for him, and it can work. But this really doesn't. And I mean, the other thing as well is, in terms of directing, I mean, there was nothing that this this was seemed very much shoot by numbers to me there was nothing particularly amazing about yeah. it or or stand out i mean you, you know i think frank oz as a filmmaker uh, we said he's done quite a variety of work and genres and all of that but he's he's not a showy filmmaker by any means is he he's just kind of he's a solid filmmaker i think i i think he is a bit beholden to like the um the studio he's working for so i think if there's he he doesn't buck the system i feel with with his films so yeah so when you come so it sometimes works in his favor that he can make a film like bowfinger 
But when it comes to like to say house sitter or the Stepford wives, you know, he he won't argue with them. He'll just yeah do what they want. And you know, unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't work out. Yeah, he's very diplomatic in in any interviews I've seen of his or commentaries I've listened to. He's he's very diplomatic and. Um, uh, he does sound like, I mean, I would say as a filmmaker, which, you know, ov- obviously is part of the job to a certain extent, but, you know, he is very much a, a, a collaborator. Um, but I, I think he's more one of those that doesn't necessarily, and it's only an assumption, I don't know this, but doesn't necessarily come to the mm. set with all the ideas. I think he comes and maybe asks a lot of people for their ideas and inputs and chooses what he thinks is is the best route from there, perhaps, you know, in terms of his directing style, maybe. Maybe. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was very pedestrian, wasn't it? I mean, there was, there was nothing, there was no sort of standouts in it at all. I mean, the camera hardly moved. Mm. Well, it didn't appear. Yeah. It didn't feel like it was moving much. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, there's I mean, a lot there was, of his films. There wasn't that, much a style yeah, to it. There's a lot of his films I, you know, I haven't seen, but there are also some really good films in his uh, in his portfolio there, and, and certainly the ones we talked about for for Heaven, um, they were both very well made films. Uh, I feel, but um, but yeah, th- th- this this one seems to miss the mark um, again, but in a different way to the Stepford Wives, it doesn't feel like it's been particularly interfered with. It just feels like the, I mean, everything starts from the script, doesn't it? And in this case, I just don't think it's a particularly yeah. strong script because it it's just so, you know, it's just so unbelievable to, to an extreme that it, that it's, that it's, oh, I don't know. I just don't think the premise is particularly good. Um, and yeah. Just thinking about his other films and stuff, I'm not a big fan of Little Shop, Little Shop of Horrors. Now, as a film, I've always oh, been, you're not. Okay. No, I'm not. Um, I, I've tried to go back and watch it several times, and I just, I, I just don't. It doesn't catch me. I mean, the only bit I like is the Steve Martin stuff as the dentist. Yeah, yeah. I like the song, and I like the bit when Bill Murray turns up and is, you know. He's off the pain. Yeah, exactly. But the the rest of it, I'm not a big fan of. Um, I mean, I mean, I enjoyed Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Um, I mean, I saw that one at the cinema, and I I I enjoyed it. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not a film I've gone back to watch. No, I'll tell you one I haven't seen. What's that? I never saw In and Out, the film with Kevin Klein, which uh, I've heard is very good, actually, but I've not heard seen that. It's very enjoyable. I I, I saw that one at the cinema, and it, it's very it's very enjoyable. And it was, you know, it it was a nice premise that worked really well. That whole idea of of him being outed on TV mm-hmm. at the Oscars, and then it's sort of people kind of clicking that oh wait a minute maybe he is gay. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, you know, I I don't know if the actual subject matter is kind of kosher now, but uh, I as a story, it kind of worked. It was enjoyable. It didn't, you know, it wasn't. You didn't come out of it going, "Wow, that's just gay bashing." Right, right. You no. Know? Well, interestingly, it's the same writer as did the Stepford Wives um, reimagining. So, mm. I mean, you're talking about, you know, seven years difference. So. You know, In and Out was an original story. Uh, Stepford Wives was probably, um, you know, like a, a studio assignment. Yeah. So you don't know what they're going to bring to it, mm. you know, writing wise. Indeed. Indeed. Maybe he should have just bought more of the uh, Jedi Master um, to his 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 directing. <laughs> mm, director, I am. Listen, you must. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. Yeah. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> or he could have just used the force. That's right. <laughs> absolutely. You won't follow my direction. <laughs> um, I... Did you ever see uh, the Indian in the cupboard? No. Is that one good? I've not seen that one. 
it, it is it's 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 very nice uh, but there's a nice little star wars nod in there because oh. the the idea is um the kid has has a has a, a cupboard that brings toys to life so he puts his darth vader toy oh in there, right okay and you sort of see like a, a miniature sized darth vader it's a it's a nice little nod to the uh to to star wars and it doesn't it's only like one shot he should have put a miniature Yoda in there. <laughs> I think that would have been too on the head, you know, too much on their nose. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm in agreement with your picks anyway. Um, yeah. I don't know. There's, there's, there's not much else to say about Frank Oz, really. No. Uh, you know, he's just he's got an eclectic collection of films that, you know, they're well known and stuff. But uh, as a director, he's... He his he doesn't have a style, you know. It's he, when you watch one of his films, they they're all very different, but they don't have like the Frank Oz signature, you know. It's like if you were sitting down and watching like a Scorsese or Kubrick, you would know straight away that that's whose film you were watching. With Frank Oz, you can't really tell. There's there's no sort of stamp to it. You know? No. It's a bit like what we were saying about John Irvin uh, a few um, a few mm. uh, podcasts ago, and uh, very much. I mean, you know, he's 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 had a solid body of work, and um, he, you know, he's still. I, I guess he's still doing projects at the moment. Um, let's have a look on IMDb and see what he's up to. But, uh, well, his last film was Death at a Funeral, which was 2007. And then they have got him listed as doing uh, directing a TV episode. And after that... Oh, Leverage. Yeah. But uh, since then, it's kind of been acting. Yeah, I mean, he's been back to voicing Yoda on the Star Wars Rebels animated series. According to this. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's sort of doing a lot of voice acting and stuff and still does Sesame Street. Uh, though I know he has no involvement with the Muppets now. Oh, what the new show that's just come out? Uh, I think he had no involvement with the films. All oh, right, the new films that came out from Disney. Yeah. Mm, well, Disney own everything, don't they now? Yeah, I was going to say it's a good thing he's not in the new Star Wars film or hearing in that either. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> there you go. It all comes back to Star Wars, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. in fact you know you know uh in the last one where you were saying about um the new film coming up and all this sort of thing one thing I, I meant to say at the time one thing i'm slightly annoyed about um is i i'm just sad that they've chosen to release it in every type of format possible so it's in imax it's in 3d it's in all these yeah. different things whereas to be honest if they just released it 235 to one two-dimensional it's not like the film's going to do bad is it <laughs> you, you know what i mean yeah it is covering all the bases and stuff and you know giving people what they want and, you know there's some people who do like 3d uh some people i mean imax is you know it's nice to watch stuff on IMAX. I mean, I don't know if it was anything was specifically shot for IMAX. Apparently, there's one scene, there's one scene in IMAX, apparently. So I've heard, right. but I, I've tried to avoid most things on it. Okay. But I've, that's the little I've heard. Yeah. I mean, I'd I, I, I look forward to watching a whole film in IMAX, but um, the reason why we haven't got that yet is because the cameras are very noisy. So to do dialogue scenes with them is very, very difficult. Hence why, uh, especially with, you know, the last two Batman films, you um, you had that whole thing, if you bought the Blu-rays of them, that the screen kept changing size from shot to shot. Yeah, which is kind of annoying. <laughs> so, and the thing was, it, it looked, it's very annoying. I mean, I love, it, the IMAX stuff on Blu-ray looks beautiful, looked really nice, and then it would shrink back down and shrink back up and, yeah, it, it would be nice to have that and have an option just to watch it in 2.35 to 1. But uh, unfortunately, there isn't that on the Blu-ray, which is, uh, yeah, very annoying. But, uh, yeah, we'll we'll be going to watch um, Star Wars, which, you know, I think when this one comes out is only days away. Hey. 
So uh, we'll... I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> I don't know where. Like... I'm trying not to be. We we got this excited last time with Phantom Menace, and look what happened. True. Very true. You know. <laughs> so it's just let's. I, I'm just sort of. I'm gonna go and see it. I don't know when. I mean, if all reports are correct, you want to go and see opening weekend. If you haven't bought the ticket already, <laughs> you know, you're you're screwed. Yeah, I've got one thanks to my good friend Ian. All right, so I'm lucky. <laughs> I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to try and see it during the week or something like that. You know. All right, I think we're going to end this here. <laughs> I think we've covered as much of Frank Oz as we can. <laughs> a little bit of Star Wars. <laughs> um, so, Keith, how can we find your work? Okay, well, uh, if you go to YouTube and put in British Isles, spelled E-Y-L-E-S, uh, you can see some of my uh, work there and make contact via that if you wish to do so. Uh, you can find my work at independentrunnings.com. Uh, you can also uh, find this podcast on Stitcher, Mixcloud, YouTube, and iTunes. Also, check out our uh, Facebook page and our Twitter feed. Yes, yeah, so please leave us a, a rating or a review, either on iTunes or Stitcher, uh, and just help spread the word. So, um, Thank you for joining us and um, join us for our next episode. Mm, join us, you must. <laughs>